Well, good morning to those of you who are here, as well as those of you who are watching online. I want to encourage you to turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 8. We are continuing our series, Jesus Up Close, and we're really taking a close look at the life of Jesus. Um, In 2018, Laura and I were able to go to Israel, and we were able to tour around the country um, with some people with the church that we were serving in at that time, and really get to um, see and experience some of these places that we see in the Bible. And we would visit three and four uh, different locations each day, and it's really a lot to take in because, I mean, we're talking about cities from like the Old Testament all the way into the New, and just the historical context of each one is so significant. And kind of what it felt like is we would arrive at these different places and there would be like just this informational download. Like we just downloaded a book in an hour and read the whole thing cover to cover and you know, we're just digesting those four or 500 pages and then going to the next site and doing the same thing. And so it was kind of this pattern where we were just trying to honestly retain as much as we could, uh, hang on to as much as we could, and learn as much as we could. One of the places we got to go to was a place called Caesarea Philippi. Now, Caesarea Philippi um, is a pretty unique place. It's, It's about 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. This is the farthest north that we ever see Jesus go with his disciples. And as they're walking there, he asks them an important question. But the thing about Caesarea Philippi is it's found at the base of this mountain, and it's actually at the base of a cliff that is at the end of this mountain range. And on that cliff, there is this large cave. And in that cave, they would actually make sacrifices to the different gods that they served in that city. And over time, they served different gods. We can, we can actually track this city back all the way through the Old Testament and see that it's named different things because different people are ruling it and then it gets conquered and they introduce new gods and there's new temples and whatever else. But what's consistent is this cave, which also is a spring and provides water for the Jordan River, is a place where they do sacrifices. And if you look kind of to the right of the cave along the cliff side, they actually have etched out places, um, these place holders, for the different idols that they were worshiping and that they were serving. And so um, when you're there, you can go and you can see it, you can walk around and all of these things are going on. And what's interesting about this city really is when we start to study, we have to start asking some different questions of it because it seems as though the people in this city would worship whichever God was fitting in the moment, that they would turn to whichever idol could um, give them what they want in the moment, could heal them in the moment, could give them wealth or health or whatever the case, right? They were seeking out specific things and they would turn to specific gods that they worshiped to find what they were looking for. And as we look at this today, this idea of them seeing multiple gods, looking at multiple gods as the answer to fit their multiple needs, we have to ask the question, do we really behave any differently? Do we really live any differently? That's kind of the question we want to explore this morning. Before we jump into our passage, let's open in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the chance to come and to study this, to be reminded of the truth of your word. God, we pray that you would guide us and lead us through this time, that you would speak to us through your Holy Spirit, and that we would walk away better knowing who you are. Lord, we love you. We commit ourselves to you in your name. Amen. All right, we're in Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 27. It says, And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them not to tell anyone about him. As we look at this passage, we see that Jesus starts by asking, honestly, what seems to be this simple, straightforward question, and then he follows up with a more personal, more direct question, specifically to his disciples, and he's looking for a little bit different answer once we uh, get to the disciples, and we can see that there's a difference, and the reason for this difference is actually rather simple. It's because 
Jesus always loved the crowds, right? He always had affection for them. And through Mark to this point, we see that his popularity is growing and growing. People are coming from all over the place to listen to his teaching, uh, to see a miracle, to see him cast out demons, right? They want to know and experience Jesus. They want to come and be part of whatever he is doing because it is remarkable. It is unheard of, his divine ability, right? And so there's these people coming from different places and different times, um, and they're seeing everything that's going on here. But the reality is the crowds are only with Jesus for moments at a time. They're, they're with him for maybe a day, sometimes two or three. But most of the time, it's really they're there for an afternoon or a morning, and they're engaging with him a little bit. They're seeing a little bit of miracle being done. They're hearing a little bit of teaching being done. But they don't get to interact with him on a day-to-day basis. And the disciples interact with Jesus daily. They, they are with him all the time. Everything he's doing, they have a front row seat and they are observing all of it. So yeah, they know Jesus on a little bit different level than the crowds do, than the people do. And Peter's answer is reflective of that knowledge, of knowing him more personally and more int- intimately. And as we get into this, I think, I think there's several things that we need to be aware of and that we need to be studying. Um, First of all, it's interesting to watch how people will talk about different things. Now, when we look specifically at the crowd's answer, when we look at what's going on there and we see that they have an idea of who Jesus is, they have an idea that he is prophetic in some way, that, that he's able to see the hearts of man, that he's able to speak truth into that, we also see they don't, they don't have the full picture. Their answer isn't sufficient, and that's why Jesus turns to the disciples and asks the second question. But where does that answer that they have come from? Well, it comes from that somewhat irregular interaction that they have with him, right? That, that going out to see him and hear him teach for a day or two, that seeing a miracle, that seeing him cast a demon out of someone and do these remarkable things. These are all significant in and of themselves, and it's showing who Jesus is. It's showing his divine authority. And so what they have started to do, the the main way of communicating in that day and time was actually through word of mouth, that you would uh, discuss the things that you've seen that's going on, and you would hear about Jesus. So there's people who have heard about Jesus that have never interacted with him. There's people who have interacted with him just a little bit, but really have not spent much time with him. There's some who have spent a little bit more time with him, but the crowds in general really are not engaging Jesus on a regular basis, yet they have their assumptions and their opinions about who he is, and they're talking about it with regularity. And this is a dangerous thing. When we talk about things that we've seen and heard, and the only thing that people are receiving is our perspective or our opinion. More than that, I I think one of the things that's overlooked here is that the people had Jesus among them. The, The Son of God was walking with them, and they didn't see it. They didn't recognize it. They didn't understand the opportunity that was before them. And I think today we, we really need to ask the question, are, are we any different? Because we have very much the same opportunity. We, we have the word of God, the breath of the Lord on these pages We can choose to seek him day in and day out to learn about who he is, what he's done, and what he's going to do. This is the way that he's chosen to reveal himself. This is the way that he's chosen to communicate with us. Now, we receive communication in multiple ways. God has uh, created us in a way that we have multiple abilities and ways that he is able to speak into us, that he's able to speak truth into us. One of those ways is that we come here on Sunday morning and we worship together. And that is a good and right thing. That is a thing that we celebrate, that we can come together, that we can study the word, and that we can dig deeper into it. But it becomes problematic when that's our only avenue of knowing the Lord. In fact, it's a significant problem when your main interaction with this book, with with the Word of God, comes through the filter of other people. When you walk into this room, my hope and my desire would be that you, you would come in having read 
even the passage that we're on today, that you would have some understanding of what's going on here so that as you're hearing it, you're discerning from the lens of the perspective of the Word of God what is happening, what is occurring, so that you can grow, so that you can develop, so that you can know this more in depth, right? But also so that you can regurgitate it on your own because I think our temptation is to come into this room once a week, or maybe we're in a Bible study and in a life group as well, so we have maybe two or three different times a week where we're coming in and we're hearing someone else regurgitate everything that they've studied, everything that they're wrestling with, the the way that God has laid this conviction on their heart. And it's like we think we can just take that conviction and we can shape it and, and mold it and apply it to our life as if that was the conviction that God gave to me. And we've not wrestled with the word on our own. We've not wrestled with this text. We've not studied it at all. It's a significant problem because we're relying on another person's interpretation. Our, our main understanding of the Bible becomes relying on other people's interpretations. It's a problem because instead of receiving the, the truth of the word of God by interacting with it, by having regular interaction with the Lord in prayer and in our quiet time, right? We, we instead actually show that we are less committed in that we're not, we're not willing to put time aside. We're not willing to go and do this on our own. We would rather kind of get the spark notes aversion from someone else. We would almost rather let them do the work, let them find the meat, the, the things that are important in the passage, and present them to us so that we can just walk away with the important things. And we miss the context. We miss the greater picture and the crowds here. They're missing the greater picture of who Jesus is. They don't see the full image. And we here today need to understand that, look, he is so valuable. We need to see the full image, and the image is presented through his word. It's presented by studying his word, by seeking after him day in and day out. Hearing what people have to say about Jesus is not enough. Coming on Sunday morning and hearing a sermon is not enough. Listening to sermons in your car while you drive to work or to school is not enough. That is all through the filter of someone else, and that can become very problematic because we have a tendency to become spark notes followers of Jesus who just want to be served the meat and nothing else. But Jesus is not looking for those type of followers. He, he isn't looking for people to come and cheer him on a few times a week. When Jesus turns and asks the disciples, but who do you say that I am? It carries a different type of weight. It's actually much more personal and and kind of direct to in their face almost. It's saying, hey, look, you've been walking with me for some time. You're, You're with me day in and day out. You have this front row seat to everything that's happening. You've seen miracle upon miracle upon miracle. You've heard teaching upon teaching. You've seen me cast out demons. You've seen all of these things going on day in and day out. And really the question he's asking here is not just what do you say about me, what do you have to say about me, but he's saying, do you know me? Do you know who I really am? Do you know why I am here? And and seeing the cliff in the background with with the temple to Pan, which was the God they were serving during Jesus' time in Caesarea Philippi, and then seeing the idols that are hanging on the side of the cliff, Peter looks at Jesus and says, You're not one of these. You are the Christ. And I believe that for Peter or for us to genuinely answer this in this way, with with this honest belief that Jesus is the Christ, it carries commitment, it carries weight behind it. it. It carries intentionality behind it because we're not just saying, oh yeah, you're, you're a god like one of these. One of these useless statues. Instead, to call him Christ 
is to understand him as the Son of God, the Savior of the world. You are actively declaring his divinity within this statement. You're declaring his power and his majesty. You're understanding that this man, Jesus, who is standing before you is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Savior of the world, the one and only person who deserves all of our attention, faithfulness, and devotion. To say you are the Christ carries commitment to him. We don't see it in the book of Mark, but if we look at Matthew's account of what happens here, we see it in Matthew 16, 17. Jesus actually responds to Peter's answer. And he says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. It is so important for us to understand that by coming in on Sunday morning, that by going to Bible study, by going to life group, these are all good things. These are all ways in which we learn, right? But flesh and blood do not have the ability to communicate the way that God does. Flesh and blood cannot reveal the depths of truth as God can. I can do my best to present this word to you and I can speak to the best of my ability and spend hours upon hours upon hours on just one or two words or verses at a time and we can walk through this very slowly but if God is not the one you're relying on to reveal it to you, then your heart is misplaced. Peter did not come to the conclusion that Jesus was the Christ by listening to what other people had to say, he came to that conclusion by allowing Jesus to reveal it to him by spending time with him day in and day out, following him wherever he went, listening to his teaching, living life with him. It's a significant problem when your main interaction with the word of God is through the filter of someone else because flesh and blood cannot Reveal the depths of truth. It is by spending time with God. It is by listening to sermons as well. It is by interacting with others. It is by spending time in prayer. It is by going out and proclaiming the gospel as we are called. There are so many avenues in which we need to be growing, but we also need to have an understanding of what this book says. Because when we spend time in this book, we interact with God in the way that he has chosen to reveal himself to us. And so we need to position ourselves to seek him in that way. It's interesting as we come to this portion of scripture in Mark because it's in this moment when everything shifts, everything kind of pivots. The whole direction of the book of Mark changes from this point forward. Up till now, we've seen Jesus do all these divine things, right? We've seen over and over that he has shown himself as divine in his ability to do everything he's done. We read story upon story of healing after healing and teaching after teaching and how his teaching wasn't just like hearing a pastor, but it carried significant amounts of weight. There was some kind of greater authority behind it, right? We see all of these things that he's done, and it's been this consistent pattern of revealing himself, of showing himself that he is the Christ, the Son of God. And then we come to verse 31, and he has a different focus. Let's see if we can pick up on this. Verse 31 says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, but turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. The focus that changes here is this, Jesus is no longer going to be so concerned with revealing his divine nature. Instead, he's going to present himself as the Christ. What does it mean that he is the Christ? 
because now that they're having plain conversation that this is who he is, they genuinely believe it, and through their statement, through their confession, they are committed to him, and they're committed to this idea and truly believing that he is the Son of God, the King of Kings. Jesus is going to start saying, look, you need, you need to be prepared for what's next because your understanding is not my understanding. You think you know what's going to happen, and you don't. You see, the common teaching in that time, the, the understanding of the people, of the religious leaders, was that when Jesus would come, he would come as a conqueror. He would come as a military-like leader who would come and be a victorious leader that would lead Israel through all kinds of battles and they would be freed from oppression, they would be freed from the countries around them, and that they would establish this earthly kingdom. After all, he's from the line of David, right? When we think back to David, we think of the line where it says, Saul killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands, right? David led Israel into battle after battle and they were victorious, and the assumption about who Jesus was going to be is that he would very much do the same thing. But Jesus is like, look, you guys, you got it all wrong. You've been listening to other people and you've not been studying the word. You didn't hear what the prophets had to say because they've said it over and over. That I would come, that I would be arrested, that I would be beaten, that, that I would take the punishment of the world, that I would be hung on a cross and that I would die. They had no frame of reference for that. They had no understanding as to how that could make sense. There, there was no paradigm in which they could fit that and make that work. They didn't understand what it meant for Jesus to be the Christ, that he would have to be the slaughtered lamb. Peter, I imagine, in this interaction with Jesus, has a little bit of whiplash. <laughs> Right, just, just moments ago, he's seeing things from a heavenly perspective. He's seeing how God has orchestrated this whole thing and brought the Son of God to Israel. And then a moment later, he's being rebuked because of a comment that he made. But what happens in Peter in that moment is there's a shift of focus. There's a shift of looking at the world through a different lens. At first, he's looking through the perspective in the lens of the kingdom, and then he's looking through the perspective in the lens of what he's heard taught about the Messiah. And they had this misunderstanding. And Jesus, when, when he sees this, when he interacts with this, he, he responds just like he does in Matthew chapter 4, verse 10, which is where Satan is tempting Jesus. He says, get behind me, Satan. This temptation is not going to work. You see, Satan is using Peter in the moment to try and tempt Jesus once again. He's, he's almost presenting this idea of, look, you don't have to suffer and die. You don't have to be the slaughtered lamb. You can just be victorious, right? And if you go back and you study the temptations that Satan had given to Jesus, you'll see some similarities with this idea right here. He brings it up again. And Jesus has nothing to do with it. He has nothing to do with it. Instead, he just says, look, we're not going to talk about this because that's, that's a lie from the devil, right? Get behind me, Satan. And then he says, we're going to look at things from God's perspective. And we're going to move forward according to the plan that he has set. But as we move forward, Jesus isn't done breaking the paradigm in which the disciples had lived. See, their, their understanding still isn't there. If he was going to come and be the slaughtered lamb, that also had implications for them. Because I would imagine their assumption at the time was, since Jesus is going to be a warrior, since he's going to be victorious in battle, then we too will experience that. But Jesus says, no, that's, that's not how it's going to work. Let's take a look at verse 34. And calling the crowd to him, with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? 
For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here today who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. What Jesus is teaching here really expounds on the first two questions that he asked. The first one being, who do people say that I am? And notice that at the beginning here of verse 34, it says, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples. He wanted the crowd to hear this. He wanted to have compassion on them. He wanted them to know what was going on. He wanted to invite them into the same type of relationship as the disciples, but maybe in a slightly different manner, right? And so he brings them up and he says, come, hear what I have to say. And he calls them together. And he says, look, if you're going to follow me, that's great. If, you, if you're going to be a child of mine, that's great. But there's some things you need to know about that. I'm not coming as some worldly, victorious war hero. I'm coming as the slaughtered lamb. And because I'm coming as the slaughtered lamb, there are some implications with that. And the crowd, I mean, the crowd just wasn't really his main focus, right? He wanted them to know. He wanted them to hear. We read in Scripture up to this point that he has compassion on them, that he loves them, and and that he cares for them, but his main focus is really on his disciples. He wants to make sure that they know and understand, yet he's giving the crowd the same opportunity here. And really, if we stop and evaluate the audience, if we stop and evaluate the number of people who are coming, who are seeing him, if we were to go back and read all the different passages up to this point of who the crowd was, how they interacted with him, I, I think that we could really come to the conclusion that they didn't have the same depth of knowledge, they didn't have the same depth of commitment as the, the, as the disciples. They didn't really have this deeper understanding of who Jesus really was. And the disciples did. And so he asked this second question, but who do you say that I am? And then these implications that come with it are, look, if you're going to say I'm the Christ, if you're going to say I'm the Son of God, here's where that commitment comes in. First, you need to deny yourself. If you're going to be a child of mine, your life is no longer about you. You now belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So put aside your personal preferences, put aside your political preferences, put aside these things that are about you because this life is not about your opinion and it's no longer about you. It is about God. He says, if you're going to follow me, you must pick up your cross and follow me. In other words, it's not going to be a cakewalk. It's not going to be easy. In fact, some of you may die on behalf of the gospel, on behalf of telling other people about who I am and what I've done. And then he goes on to explain that to claim to be a child of the Lord, someone who has put their trust and faith in him, and then to continue to try to live life your own way, to try and live life the way you want, when you want. That is not a life in which you will gain anything. There's, there's nothing to be gained there. Instead, he says, you will lose your life because the reality of what is happening in that situation is the same as what we see in Caesarea Philippi that they worshipped these different gods whenever they had different needs. Whenever they wanted a different need met, they would turn to someone else. They would be loyal to that God that would help them or whichever one fit their preference in the moment. And what we do is we have this tendency to come in together to worship, to hear the word of God, and then to go home and to serve multiple other gods. To serve Personally, for me, it's food, right? <laughs> to serve food on the week of Thanksgiving is a wonderful thing in some senses. It's also painful if you go too far. But we serve time, we serve money, we serve our jobs, we serve our preferences. 
Are we interacting with God throughout the course of the week? Or are we just coming when it's convenient? Are we just wanting to hear in the moment of this divine ability, right? Feel his presence in some way. Engage him for just a moment, just enough to get us through the week. Do we use him just enough to fit our preferences and our desires? Because in that process, really what we're doing is we're making ourselves the God of our life choosing what we want, when we want, and how we want it. Jesus' call for his disciples is to not live like that, but to have their attention completely and totally fixated on who he is. He's like, look, these other gods that are on the face of this cliff, the other gods that are being sacrificed to here, look, these things are not right in your life, and they need to come out. These are the things that we need to be repenting of, that we need to be turning back to God and saying, I don't want to engage this anymore because I'm pursuing you, because I am committed to you, and I love you in this way. The reality of what our relationship with God is to look like is that we don't get to be the ones who mold and shape him to fit our life. He is to mold and shape us to fit the kingdom. The call of the Christian is to be devoted to him no matter the cost. To seek him daily by spending time in his word and through prayer. If you want to really know him and not just know him as a God that's on the face of that cliff, then you really have to focus on spending time with him. You need to position yourself to have quality interaction with him day after day after day, to be committed in this way. It is through this book, it is through spending time with him, it is through being deliberate that he's going to continue to reveal himself. And it's not going to happen overnight, it's not something you can force, it's not something that's just going to happen. It is a lifelong learning process. And he will reveal himself. In significant and meaningful ways, he will reveal himself to you. In fact, if you continue to read into chapter 9, we actually read about the transfiguration where Jesus takes three of his disciples up on the mountain and basically reveals himself in a more whole way. He reveals his holiness to them. He reveals this image of glory for just a moment. We are to continue to seek God. We are to continue to be committed to him, both here and outside of these doors, anywhere we go. Our lens is to be the one that has a focus on the kingdom and not to be a spark notes Christian who comes in to just meet, to eat the meal that was prepared by someone else, that was put together by someone else, who, who sat and thought and was convicted by the Lord, who interacted with it, and met the Lord. We're not to try and live off them as if they're the conduit to God. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. My fear when we come to passages like Matthew 7 is that there are far more Sparknotes Christians in this room than there should be. That there are several of us who are just leaning on everyone else, who are not pursuing God on our own, but rather we'll just let someone else provide and serve the meal. We'll regurgitate it for a little bit, we'll chew on it for a little bit, maybe we'll try and take something out of it, and, and maybe we'll grow a little bit. That's not what the call is. Jesus wants us to know him personally, 
to interact with him daily. And there are so many false gods. There are so many ways for us to turn and to worship ourselves and to worship other things. The issue with our society today is we don't make a graven image of that. Instead, it's something that's buried in the depths of our heart. And so when we really think about it, all of the ways in which we are distracted from God, all of the avenues that we sometimes get pulled, we are hopelessly lost. And the only way for us to not be hopelessly lost is if we know him. And so the question today is, do you really know him? Like, do you really know him? Not as the crowds knew him, not what other people say about him, not just hearing a message once or twice a week, but do you really take time with him and spend it with him on your knees in prayer and in his word, studying who he is, the way that he has revealed himself through, through scripture? My prayer and my hope is that each of us would leave with a desire to be committed day in and day out that we would take time to spend with Jesus and that we would live life looking through the lens of the gospel at every single situation. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the time that we have to come and study your word. And God, as we consider this question, who do you say that I am? Lord, I pray that you would teach us better and better each day how to respond to that more like your disciples who knew you, who spent every day with you. God, help us to move away from the shallow surfaces of the water and move into the depths of the sea. Help us to love you more and more each and every day to be completely and totally committed to you. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In your name, amen.